as we pick up here, uh, chapter 1 ended uh, with Paul uh, just labeling to the church at Rome all of these sins. <laughs> And, and, and he's saying, these are all the things that, that you uh, Gentiles are, are dealing with, uh, whether currently or it's in your past, in your background, or you're just rubbing shoulders in this, um, in, in this difficult cultural climate to, to follow Jesus in Rome. Uh, people aren't doing it. And, and, and so, uh, you know, he, he highlights all of these sins. And then in chapter 2, he turns his attention... Uh, to all of the religious Jews who at the end of chapter one are saying, way to go, Paul, way to address them. The thems, as I like to call them. So Paul turns in chapter two and he addresses the religious Jews and I think he addresses most of us. And like I said, this is a challenging spot. And whenever uh, there's a challenging section of Scripture that, that is going to call out areas of our lives, um, it's always brutal because that's what's been happening for me all week. And, and so I just know that there is um, some things in us that God wants to reveal, and then bring transformation to. And so let's start in chapter 2, verse 17. It says, but if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? <laughs> While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So verse 17, uh, Paul reminds us who he's talking about all through chapter 2. He's speaking to the religious Jew here, isn't he? And, and uh, you know, th these are the individuals who have separated themselves from the thems of chapter 1. Those that are falling into those sins or who have that temptation and fall into, like, or that background. They're, they've separated themselves from them. And, and so Paul here in verse 17 he, he kicks it off with essentially a direct shot at them, doesn't he? If you call yourself a Jew. Now, I want you to just imagine this good, uh, you know, right-standing Jewish individual reading that. Because being read out loud, what do you mean, Paul, if I call myself a Jew? Right? That's how they're receiving this. And I think for us this morning, if we insert the word Christian for Jew, we see the challenge, don't we? If you call yourself a Christian. And so in the rest of chapter 2, Paul describes the person that he's speaking to as morally decent and religiously active. They're morally decent and they're religiously active. And the Jews were both of these things. And yet, neither one of those things could make them righteous. And so he says, you call yourself a Jew. And, and when he's saying that, he's highlighting that, that this name, uh, just being a Jew, it refers to the people of Israel. It carried this special and unique status as a very set-apart people of God. And so uh, the, the, they took great 
pride in their name. And, and, and so he continues and he says, you rely on the law. In other words, you are individuals who, who, who trust in having the law. You trust in, in how you know the law. And then he says, you boast in God. In other words, you, you brag about your relationship to God. Um, I mean, God had chosen these people. He had set them aside, right? We, we read that in scripture in Exodus chapter 19, verses four through six. It says, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So they've grown up as little kids hearing that message, hearing those verses. Listen, bud, you are the set aside child of God. We are distinctly different from everyone else so that they, could, they would see us and know who God is. And so that, that very truth, instead of being a blessing back to God, actually started to become a source of pride. He, he, he says, you, 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 will, you know his will and you approve of what is excellent. So what he tells them, uh, so, so these, are, these religious Jews, they were able uh, to make correct ethical uh, decisions and they were able to see the wrong choices that others were making. It was clear to them. They were seeing that. Um, he's saying, you're, you're instructed by the law. Uh, I mean, they, they had the law. Uh, from childhood, they were, they were preached the law. They memorized the law. They had mastered the law. They could quote it. They could cross-reference it. They could go into deep details of the law. And then he says, you're convinced that you're a guide for the blind, right? Uh, so, so they've been taught. And not only have they been taught to know, but they've been taught so that they can then teach others. That was part of their, their mission. In fact, Isaiah 49, 6, right? Uh, it, it, it tells us, I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. So, so you are to be the light bearers, the one that speaks into those who are in darkness, the one uh, who, who don't know yet what, what they're to believe. And, and, and what I see here is that Paul has in many ways just described how many of us feel about ourselves. Then he throws a curveball. He says, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? Whew. Are you excluding yourself from what you're preaching and teaching to other people? Are you practicing what you're calling all of these other people to practice? Because your life indicates, or I should say your heart even more so indicates that you're not sitting under your own preaching. <sighs> I'll be honest, this is personally one of my greatest fears. It's one of my greatest fears. That somehow, some way, I could, I would start to disconnect myself from the teaching to where I could just conveniently speak to you, but not have it speak to me. And there's a danger with that, isn't there? There's a danger. We start to read scripture. Oh, I hope so-and-so is here. I hope so-and-so hears that. Oh, so-and-so needs this. Steve, I'm glad you covered those verses. So-and-so was there, right? So, so we get into this mindset. And, and I honestly, I don't think it's like <laughs> malicious. I think it's just like, a lot of times it comes from like, I care, right? But, but all of a sudden, we slowly start to veer off. And, and pastors do this uh, where we start to preach a message to everyone else that we ourselves are not applying. 
And Paul lists then three ways that the self-confident moral Jew he's speaking to isn't practicing what he's teaching. Uh, he says, you steal. You're, you're committing adultery. You're, you're saying, I, I hate idolatry, and yet you rob in temples, right? He calls these things out. Now, were all of the Jews doing these things? No, of course not. Not every Jew is robbing temples. But Paul, Paul's saying something that is generally true here. And some of these are specifically true. But he's saying, all of you are in one way or another guilty before a perfect and holy God. Like, none of you have kept the law fully. See, moralism, uh, it, it, it fails because we're all inconsistent in our behavior, aren't we? Just say amen. You just are, okay? And, and, and so we, we have the law. I say you have the law. You, you, you know it, but no one fully keeps it. And, and at times, it's very blatant, right? It's, it's, it's very public, Okay, like many of us have experienced that, haven't we? Uh, where uh, it was like, man, that sin, I can't hide from it. Everyone saw that. Everyone heard that. Um, you, you know, you, you look at those times. And, and, and then there's other times where it's these actual sins of the heart. Where there's something beneath the surface that is sinful, that I'm thinking, that I'm wanting to happen that I'm hoping will happen. And it reflects my motives too, being sinful. And so it's possible for a Jew to be guilty of theft, adultery, and idolatry, even if they haven't physically committed those sins outwardly. Right? I mean, uh, when we look at the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gave, we're told that these sins can be committed in the heart. Like, like when Jesus was giving this message, it, it turned upside down. This whole behavioral religion, this moralism that I can be right through what I do or, or don't do. And, and, and so in that passage, Jesus actually extends the definition of adultery from the purely external to include the heart Motives. What did Jesus say? He says, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And so uh, we, we see that Paul is, is literally using that same principle here. He's like, okay, yeah, you want to talk about idolatry. You, you may not physically go into that temple and physically bow down to that false idol that they have built, but... You've replaced God in your life with this thing, with this desire, with this identity. And you, although may not be going physically to the temple, you are beneath the surface bowing down to an idol. Right? So, he, so he's calling uh, this out in these uh, people, right? He's, he's calling these things out. Now, they were doing some of those things. Like, some of them were uh, stealing from their own people, right? They were inflating costs. They were uh, over, um, you know, they were charging ridiculous interest for things, ripping off their own people, which you could say is stealing uh, from them. There's a lot of things happening. We know in Moses' day that, that people were just getting divorces. Like, ah, I don't like her. I like her now. Divorce, right? And so these things were happening, and, and, and ultimately those things are coming from a uh, adulterous desire. And, and, and so we're seeing that. Um, but what happens here that he's trying to highlight is these Jewish people had a religion of outward action, but not inward attitude. And what you and I need to understand and know very clearly is that God not only sees the deeds that we do, but he also sees the thoughts and the intents of our hearts. Like, like you could fool me so easily, right? Like, I don't, and, and I don't assume you're trying to. Like, when you tell me something, I'm like, great, you know? I, I'm not hanging out with you all week. I don't go home with you. There's only one person in this room I go home with, and I can't really fool her very well. But for the most part, you know, you can fool anybody. 
You can fool, you can go, oh, I have an accountability group. You can fool your accountability group. I hear about it all the time. You can, you can fool your spouse. You can fool your kids. You can, although the little they are, man, it's tough to fool the little ones. I mean, man, they're on there like, they're like, no, let me tell you how it is. And it's like, oh my goodness. It's like a mirror into my soul, you know? Um, but God sees what's really beneath the surface. So why do we continue to pretend he doesn't? And then why do we act towards other people in a way that pretends he doesn't? I mean, we know through scripture, I mean, Hebrews 4.12, it tells us for the word of God is living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's piercing to the division of soul and of spirit and of joints and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Like, like that's, where, that's where he is going to move and to shake in our lives. And, and in 2 Timothy 3.5, Paul rebukes people for having a form of godliness, but lacking the substance of it. He says this, he says, having the appearance of godliness, but denying his power. And he says, avoid such people. And so who he's talking to is the people who the outward form is there, but it's an empty shell. And once God examines the heart beneath the surface, there's no internal reality, which means he's calling out the hypocrisy. The hypocrisy. That's the judgment that Paul's giving to Israel, but it also has application to us, doesn't it? See, I have to, I have to ask myself, am I teaching myself, right? Am I, am I looking at scripture and am I reading it, not so that I can just preach it or proclaim it or challenge people, but am, am I approaching it and saying, teach me? Like, teach me. Start with me. Because I think so often I agree with what the Bible says, but I never allow it to change me. Right? I agree with what Hebrews 4.12 just said, but do I truly believe that and live that out? Like God's word is alive, that it is active, and that it is designed to pierce into the innermost core of my being, my heart, the place that drives all of my thoughts, the intents, the actions, the words, all of those things. And am I, am I allowing it to have access there? Or am I just like these, you know, these, these religious Jews where I've just created this incredible shell and I'm totally content with myself, and the reason I'm content is because I'm so good at seeing the flaws in others. See, see, this whole posture is that I have to ask is, do I see myself? This is what it leads to, and this is what's so dangerous. Do I see myself as better than others because of what I do or what I don't do? And I want you to go really deep here because on the surface, no one's going to agree with me on that. No one's going to say, oh yeah, that's me. You got to really get to the root of your heart. You got to get to the root of the thoughts that you have towards other people. Because I'll tell you what, every once in a while, I get a glimpse of some of the real heartfelt thoughts and it is incredible, the wrath that comes out of some of us. Do I see myself as better than others because of either what I do or I don't do that. I, I'm better than them. And here's what I want to tell you. If that is you, you will, it's not if, you will treat other people that way. You will. You will. You will have labels for the thems. Oh, boy, in this politicized climate and everything, we are so great at, at, at having groups of the thems that we've labeled, huh? Right? We, we've got all of these subgroups that, oh, that's those kind of thems. That's where they are. 
I'm not like them. You're not like them. I only want to spend time with people who aren't like the thems. And, and so, and so we, we start to uh, literally uh, develop labels for the thems, and the labels are derogatory, aren't they? Right? Like, that's, that's where we're at. Like, when we're speaking about the thems, when is it ever positive? When is it ever like, oh, man, the gospel's going to reach them. Let's go. Let's pray for the thems. No, we've got labels for them, right? And, and, and this really hits home for me. This hits home for some of you because you've been labeled before. You've been labeled a them. By Christians. Who are, who are the ones that you would, man, you would pray, you could lean in on to model and reflect the sacrificial love of Jesus. And you've been labeled as a them. I mean, uh, I'll never forget. It, it, it was so crazy. Um, but in, it was like 2019, 20, I think it was 2020 when everyone just really loved each other a lot. And, um, <laughs> and, and I had someone come up to me and, and go, hey, um, so-and-so uh, says that you're woke. I go, huh? Still kind of a newer term. And they're like, yeah, that you're woke. And they put it on social media. I went, oh, that's fantastic. And, uh, and I go, well, what do you think they meant by that? <laughs> the person goes, I don't know. <laughs> I said, huh? Well, let's, I think it's in the dictionary now. Let's look it up. So we like read the definition. I said, do you think that's what they meant? No. I said, hmm. So they're saying I'm this. They definitely haven't come to me and asked me, are you this? And yet they're content to label me as that to all these people and to you. Man, that kind of sounds like gossip to me. Huh. And what I found is how normal that has become since that time for us and how much more socially acceptable it is, not just outside of the church, but in the church. The place where you would go, God, guard us from a mindset that is labeling the thems because God, we don't want to be Romans too. We don't. Protect us from those labels. Protect us from these derogatory statements where, where we're like just grouping people that we don't even know. We haven't even asked them. Like, hey, do you actually believe this? I think this term may mean that. Like, and I'm putting you in this big group of people because, well, culture does. So, hey, I, I jumped in. So where are you at? You know, like we don't even do that, right? We just, man, we just toss them into this container of people. And, 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 and all the while as we, uh, we do this, uh, which is so bad, is we're, we're gossiping about these people that we don't even know. And, and what we are doing when we do this with the thems, whoever the thems are to you, <laughs> is we're saying internally, we don't dare verbalize it, I'm better than you. I'm right, you're wrong. And, and what also happens in that, because the enemy loves this, is I start to slowly not only separate myself from my calling to be a light in the darkness, but I actually start to believe and lean into a narrative that I am better than them, whoever the thems are. And then I become Romans too. That's what I become. I will be a very good, moral, judgmental person. But I'm going to tell you right now, you guys, our religiosity, our moralism can become a poison to your soul. And it is so dangerous to the point where, do you see what Paul says to them? Do you see what he says? He says, the name of God is blasphemed 
among the Gentiles because of you. He, he, he's just highlighted, you say, you, you're, you're a light in the darkness. That you're called to teach uh, the kids, to teach them. You, you're, you're, the, you're the people set aside by God to proclaim the truth of who God is to the nations. They're to look at you and they're to desire a relationship with God. Now, listen, uh, Bible also is very clear that not everybody's going to want that. Jesus did say what? Pick up your cross and follow me. So we know that there is going to be suffering. We know that there's going to be accusations. We know that there's going to be those things. But Paul says, like, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something different here. I'm saying that, that you think of yourselves as bringing a light to those in darkness, and yet the world finds you totally unattractive. Don't you see that you must have misunderstood something? Instead of glorifying God among the Gentiles, the Jews were dishonoring God. And so Paul quotes uh, Isaiah 52, 5 to prove his point. And so these pagan Gentiles, these non-Jews who wanted nothing to do with God and who were completely stuck in idolatry, uh, they were working alongside the Jews in business and in all of these other activities, and they weren't fooled by the Jews' devotion to the law. The very law that the Jews were highlighting in themselves is the very law that indicted their actions. So the Gentiles were blaspheming God for the way the Jews were treating them. I, I, I talk to a lot of people who don't go to church. And the number one complaint about the church is that the church is full of hypocrites. And I always tell them, yes, we are. And yes, I am. And as a famous pastor once said, and there's always room for one more hypocrite. <laughs> right? And so if you're here, I like, welcome. Like, we're a mess. I'm a mess. There's so many moments this week that I modeled what I claim to not believe through thought, through action, that I have to repent for. And so we, we've got to ask this, like, as individuals, like, like are we known for, for these character qualities that should stand out in us as, as ones that who are redeemed by the gospel message of, of, of what Jesus did on the cross for you and for me, giving us new life, a new beginning, a new birth uh, to, to display uh, the fruits of the Spirit to a world who is lost, confused, in darkness, searching for anything they can, where we're in right now, a day and age, where they're, uh, where they're saying it's one of the most open to religion times ever. And that's where we're at. And so then the question becomes, is my humility, is, is my sacrificial love for people that is, man, it's tough to love, is that evident in, in these hard situations? Are they seeing a different kind of grace uh, and mercy in me? Is that obvious for others to see? Um, because I tell you what, if there's one group of people on the planet that it should be clear to see that they're operating through a different lens, it should be Jesus followers. It should be the ones claiming the name of Christ. And so we're either authenticating through how we're living and acting and speaking, we're authenticating the gospel, or we're discrediting it, discrediting it, right? Like, like it's either a like, it's either a, hey, <laughs> you desperately need this. Look what he's done to me. Or it's, stay away. Stay away. But only the gospel can produce churches and people who commend God to the world. Moralism cannot do that. Moralism as my root makes me no different than any other religion that's out there. That's telling me through that I can reach a certain status. And so the gospel is a very upside down based message for so many people. And yet it's what we're called to bring and to take and to lead and to share with the world. And so then he keeps going in verse 25. He says, For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. 
But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. I have never said the word circumcision more in one, like ever, like I don't, uh, and many of you have been like, the Bible's just weird, and that's why. And so <laughs> Paul introduces circumcision uh, into this argument, and you're like, it has nothing to do with my argument, but it is very real for these Jewish believers because that circumcision was a sign of God's covenant with his people. In Genesis 17, 9 through 14, that's literally what God is prescribing to them. And, and so uh, it, it, was a, it was a ceremony uh, by which a male was brought into the covenant community, uh, but it, just like the law, had become a source of Jewish pride. And for many of them, uh, it was the basis for, for their belief that was wrong, that their cultural identity was what gave them righteousness. That's why, I mean, this becomes, this is a huge topic in the New Testament. Huge. Where religious Jews are like, no, they can't be saved unless they're circumcised. It's not real. And Paul says, they may have this physical circumcision, but you have not experienced the circumcision of the heart. See, it was meant to point to an inner reality. And that's what scripture continues to reaffirm. In Galatians uh, 6.15, it says, for neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. It's like, let's not get lost in the shuffle here. What is most important is, is the new creation, the heart being transformed. And so Paul tells the Jews in Rome that, that, that their circumcision is no substitute for the obedience, for the, re the requirement of faith that came along with the law, that came along with that circumcision because it was a sign of the covenant and the covenant involved a commitment to obedience. And so what he's saying here is, uh, you can't do it. It actually reveals your need for a savior. Because he says, according to the law, if, if, if you're circumcised and you break it, it's as if you're not circumcised. And then he says, and if you haven't been circumcised, but you are keeping the law, <laughs> then it's as, if, it's as if you have been. And so what he's saying is what matters isn't possession of the law or this external act, but it's obedience that springs out of faith. And, and, and so in verse 27, just to highlight this, he does what Jesus did in Matthew 12. He adds that these obedient Gentiles, they're going to sit in judgment over you. Now that was like, how dare you, right? And, and Jesus did the same thing in Matthew 12. He's talking to the crowd. He's like, hey, Nineveh is going to judge you, right? Like, like upside down, everything. And, and, and so these Jews who thought they were going to be sitting in judgment, Paul's like, nope. <laughs> the ones that are actually uh, having the heart transformation, they're going to be the ones. And then Paul tells us who the true people of God are. He says, true Jewishness is not something outward and visible, but inward and invisible. One can be a Jew ethnically and yet still not be one spiritually. See, they had become dependent on the physical mark instead of the spiritual reality that it was to represent. And so God tells his people over and over again, you need to circumcise your hearts. In fact, in Deuteronomy 10, 16, he says that circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. And, and what's also awesome in the Old Testament is he says, I'm, I'm also, I'm gonna give you a new heart. 
Like, I'm going to give you a new heart. Like, I'm going to do what you could never do for yourself because that, that sinful heart is there. Uh, and, 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 and the moralism cannot work out for you. you. Like, you just can't. You cannot be perfect to the law. And so, in the new covenant era, the Holy Spirit will make this a reality for believers. We, we read this even in the Old Testament, in uh, the prophets, Ezekiel 36, 25. Uh, he says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols, I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit uh, I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to, to obey my rules. That, that's an amen moment. That he has promised that I'm gonna give you a new heart. You cannot do this on your own. I'm gonna do something for you that right now uh, you're reminded how you continue to fall short. You're reminded how you're not enough. And yet by the spirit, Something new is going to happen that the law could never have achieved for you. And then he says that, that phrase, right? That that person's praise is not from people, but from God. And this means that God's going to approve the person with the new heart. On the final day, God is going to honor those who are truly his people. And so outward conformity uh, cannot save us. The spirit of God must transform us inwardly, and this can only happen through the power of the gospel. Romans 1, 16 and 17. Remember, he, he literally says, and it kind of sets the stage for the rest of the book of Romans, he, he, he highlights what? The power of the gospel. The power of the gospel can reach and transform the Jew and the Gentile. That's the power of it. And so, uh, you know, I was just thinking about this. What is the sign of our new covenant with the Lord? What, what is that sign for us physically? It's baptism, isn't it? It's baptism. But the reality is this, baptism doesn't save anybody. Just like joining a church, like that doesn't save you. Baptism is an outward sign of what God promises to do inwardly. So the, the final analysis, when we stand before the throne, uh, it isn't whether we were baptized outwardly, but whether we were baptized inwardly. Do we possess the spiritual reality that the signs point to? And this is what Paul's saying to the Jews who were circumcised. The Pharisees, they thought that because they had this biological rooted connection to Abraham that they were guaranteed salvation. And yet Jesus calls them out like no one else and says, hey, you are whitewashed tombs. You are great at making yourself look good on the outside, but at the end of the day, you're a tomb housing a dead body. And you guys, I, I tell you what, there are people today who think they're guaranteed salvation because they grew up in a Christian home, because they were baptized, because they joined a church, because they do communion, uh, because they uh, do these other things. And I, I mean, it amazes me. I, I, I see this all the time. Uh, I was at this benefit dinner and I meet this guy and we're talking and uh, we didn't know each other. And, and, and it finally gets to that like, hey, what do you do? What do you do? moment, right? Which for me is always just like, here we go. And, and I love being a pastor. Okay. But, um, and, and you should want to be one. And so, <laughs> so it gets to that moment and, and he's like, well, what do you do? And I go, oh, I'm a pastor. And, and he goes, oh, I love God. I love him. And I was like, oh, that's great. And this is what he says. He says, yeah, this is how I vote. I was like, huh, huh, huh? He's like, yeah, I vote this way. My mindset is this way. We go to church. And this is the kind of church we attend. And this is how I was raised. And I just went, oh, my goodness. You're it. You're, a, you're one of these. You think you're good because of this and this and this and this, and you've connected that with the gospel. 
So there's this somewhat grasp of the meaning of the gospel, but there's no internal transformation. You know what I left? I left that conversation sad, but I also left that conversation extremely motivated to bring the gospel, to help bring clarity, and to make a commitment to preaching the tough sections of scripture, like the ones I don't want to read, like Romans 2. I don't want to be called out. Guys, I was called out in this all week, right? Like over and over. I, I, I mean, and it hit me in unexpected ways. Like, like I, goodness, I had a conversation with, my, with one of my sons. I sit him down. He was acting out in anger and it just kept building. And I was just like, what in the world? And, and I'm like, I got to deal with this. And I, and, I, and I sit him down and we have one of those conversations. And, and, and it's like, listen, you can't act like that. You can't allow your anger to, to do this in your, in your heart, in your life and all this. And we're having this conversation. And he just looks at me. He says, well, dad, I've just been seeing you get really angry as well lately. It just seems like you're more mad than you than you normally have been. I go, really? What do you mean by that? And uh, and my son, who's like a mirror to my soul, called out, in a loving way, and he's the he's my son that I can't like go ask ah, just you. Like, no, it's like my most morally pure son. I don't know where he came from, but God did it. And 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 he is staring back at me in a non-like, I want to go toe-to-toe with you, Dad. And just he's delivering the truth that I was preaching a message that I wasn't preaching to myself. And he challenged me in that. So to my little boy, I had to repent and ask for forgiveness. And then I walked out of the room and my wife's like, how'd it go? And I'm like, oh, awful, Um, (laughs) terrible, you know? And, (laughs) but how quickly it happens, doesn't it, you guys? How quickly it happens. And I was so great at seeing it in him. I was so great in seeing where he was out of bounds. I knew the verses. I, I knew what to say. But what I had done is I, I just slowly had disconnected myself from my own anger, my own issues, my own stress. And I had caused him Confusion, discouragement. And guys, um, this form of Christianity that he's trying to call out of us, it's this outside out thing. It's where, it's where we hear, we listen. We may even listen to the worship song. We may read scripture. We may have scripture memorized. And yet we never allow it to really penetrate our hearts. Do we? And a lot of it's just like we, we were raised, what, in a high, uh, you know, you get rewarded for what you do and what you don't do. That's, that's kind of how we're programmed as kids, right? Like, if I do this uh, and don't do that, like, mommy and daddy are happy with me, right? And so uh, what happens in, in a very innocent way is as I grow up, I take that into my relationship with Jesus, And I just think if I just do this and not do that, then we're good. And yet all the while I am neglecting my heart. And so literally what he's calling out is like, listen, church, listen, Jewish, religious, moral elite. This is an outside out thing for you. This is not what the gospel message is, which is an inward out. It is a a transform you internally so then it plays out externally for all to see and it glorifies God. And then you are that light. Guys, God looks at the heart. We're the ones caught looking in the outward appearances and we need to be reminded that our justification is by faith alone in Christ alone. 
I mean, uh, talking about the cross to the Colossian Gentile Christians, believers who hadn't been physically circumcised in Colossians 2.11, Paul says, in him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision, it says, of Christ. In other words, Christ brought you into covenant community with himself through his and his alone finished work. Whatever you want to do physically or with the law, and he doesn't negate that, but he just says, you need to know Christ has brought you in in a way that you could have never brought yourself in ever before. And so live in light of that. Only God can do this. And so we have to ask this morning, as we close our time together, we have to go to that uncomfortable space in our hearts and we have to ask, what is actually happening in my heart? the depths of my heart. Who am I really? Have I allowed my moralism, uh, my religiosity to blind me to the true condition of my heart? And as an extension of that, I have to ask, just as I was confronted with, what are the ways right now that I'm hypocritical? And one of the ways to identify that, unfortunately, is to notice that one of the marks of moralism is that I justify away my shortcomings, but highlight those in others. I I justify mine, "Eh, it's just a struggle, it's just something I do. And then I highlight ones that I don't struggle with or I don't even understand. And at the end of the day, we need to know that it's possible to be deeply religious and yet still spiritually lost. And so you guys, I want to I just call you back to the cross, call you back to the message, to the gospel of grace. And what Jesus said, he calls us out of our comfort zones. He calls us out of, of, of looking at the thems, right? I mean, all throughout Jesus's life, right? We, we, we study it, we look at it, and we go, whoa, he handled that differently, right? I mean, a lawyer in Luke, I think 10, uh, is, like, is like, hey, you know, Jesus, I'm impressive on paper, essentially. Uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? By what I read, it's love the Lord of God with all my heart, soul, and mind, and love my neighbor as myself. Uh, so what else should I do? And, and it even says he was seeking to justify himself to Jesus, which we do, right? And... And then Jesus proceeds to tell him a story, right? Uh, the story of this, this, this individual who is traveling, this Jewish individual who's traveling, and he is beaten, uh, he's robbed, he's left along the roadway to be, uh, he's left for dead. And, and then he, uh, Jesus highlights a priest, a Levite, the most religious of the religious, right, that are going to walk by, and you would assume if anybody is going to be that neighbor, that person that's going to help them out. It's one of them. And Jesus conveniently says, nope, nope. And then Jesus says, hey, and there was a Samaritan. Oh, they hated Samaritans. They hated them. They hated Samaritans more than probably any of you hate another person. They hated them. And Jesus says, he stopped. And he Help this person out. He brought him to a hotel. He paid for him to be taken care of. Who is the neighbor? You hear pin drop. Because Jesus changed how we are called to view and deal with each other in the flesh, didn't he? Through the power of the gospel. And so we go back to him. And we crawl sometimes and we just say, God, here I am broken and in need. Remind me of your power that can bring me back and remind me of what you've done. Remind me of how much you love me and the grace that I'm to extend to others. Amen.